All right. Good morning, y'all. Uh, I hope you had a wonderful drive here. Uh, so I am uh, Yusuf Farouk. I'm a space systems engineer at the Sharjah Academy for Astronomy, Space Sciences and Technology, which is a research institute that belongs to the uh, University of Sharjah. So our topic today is innovation in satellite technologies. All right, so uh, the slides are not clear, but that's fine. All right, so let's first define a satellite. What is a satellite? A satellite is, it can be a planet, it can be a moon, or it can be a machine that orbits around the fixed body. So let's say, let's break it down into two types of satellites. We have natural satellites and we have artificial satellites. Natural satellites are like the moon. You know, we have the moon, it orbits our planet Earth. So that is a natural satellite. Uh, planet Earth orbits around the sun. So the Earth is a satellite for the sun. What, what about the uh, machines that we put up there? Uh, these are satellites too, but they are artificial satellites. They are man-made objects that we intentionally place into orbit so that they can perform a specific task or a mission, conduct science, and help us live our lives better. All right, wait one second, I think it flipped. All right, so let's start by the uh, first satellite that was ever launched to space, Sputnik 1. Sputnik 1 is a Soviet era satellite. It's the first man-made object in space. Uh, Sputnik 1 is just a big ball of metal. All it had is a radio transmitter. It just kept on beeping in space. And then these beeps can be heard all over the world. Well, of course, the, the Soviets did not really do it just to, uh, to play beeping sounds in space. They did it to test and prove their abilities that we as a Soviet Union can place satellites or objects into orbit. Well, of course, uh, why is this important? It is important because it made the Americans angry. As funny as this sounds, this started the space race, right? Because the Americans were worried. Well, what's this object that keeps on, you know, going around my sky and then just peeping? Uh, well, what if it's a spy satellite? We need to do something. We need to launch more objects into space to conduct observations and sciences. That's where the Corona satellite program came in. The Corona, not the, the COVID-19 Corona, but uh, Corona actually means uh, the sun or the crown. So uh, the Corona space program was uh, started from uh, 1958, 59 to around 1972. It is a secret project by the CIA to launch a satellite that has a camera. And then that camera is going to take images of Soviet facilities, Soviet military facilities. Well, all right, we, we can understand the, uh, the idea behind you know, the militarization of space and then why the Americans wanted to take images from space of the Soviet Union. Because having your airplanes flying over, regardless of how technologically advanced your airplanes are, having them fly over the Soviet Union is risky for your pilots. Do uh, you have the chances of being exposed? So it was very risky. And then again, we understand its, uh, its importance to the, to the military industry. But how does this affect us as uh, the general population? Well, when you send things to space, you start learning a little bit. We start establishing how are we going to send the next objects into space. So it set a technological standard on what we need to consider before sending objects into space. And then one funny thing about uh, the Corona Space Satellite is how did it work? So you have the satellite flying over, taking images. People from uh, my age or from the bygone age, we remember when cameras, you know, they had that film. And then, you know, you take that image and then you had to, you know, take that film, give it to a, give it to a cameraman to, uh, to take the negatives and then turn it into an image that we can use. So uh, at that time, we did not have radio transmission or, you know, sending things via internet. We did not have this back in 1959, in the 60s, in the 70s. So the rocket would take the images, and then it would just drop the images by a parachute, you know, to drop that film by a parachute, and then you would have a plane that would just snatch the parachute, and then these would later be processed. It, that, that was how it was done back then, you know. Now we just, we want to send an image, we just send it on WhatsApp, and then the other party gets it. So, what about modern satellites? When, when you think of satellites nowadays, you think of these big mega structures that have, you know, like winged solar panels, that's right, you know, you, you, your mind is in the right place. But then these are considered to be mega satellites, big satellites. Well, 
now the trend is changing. What about those satellites? You know, you can have satellites as small as a credit card. You can have a satellite that is as big as a coffee mug. You know, you can see my coffee mug here for scale. You can have a satellite that is as big as your loaf of bread, right? I, I would have loved to use bananas because this generation uses bananas to scale. But yeah, it can be around the, the length of a banana, you know, a banana plus a little bit. A loaf of bread is a, is a standard size, I believe. So what happened to those satellites? They're small. Can, can we achieve our science? Can we achieve our objectives with just small satellites? Yes, we can. And how we can do this is in, in many ways. But let's briefly discuss uh, a substandard topic. Remember how I mentioned how images before were taken? The, the image had to be taken and then dropped from space. And then sometimes the pilot would mishook the, the film and then it would just drop into the sea and we'd miss all our data. So let's talk about how these perform photography in our modern world. So this class of, uh, this class of satellites is called a CubeSat. So a CubeSat is a, is a class of nanosatellites. It's a standardized in dimension. It's, uh, you know, it's considered in units. So you have one unit, which is 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters, two units, which is 10 by 10 by 20, three units, which is 10 by 10 by 30, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So why, do, why is CubeSats the new trend? Well, because when you have something that's small, commercially off the shelf, it means that it's easy. Like kids in schools can do it. Uh, I use that image to, uh, to persuade our university professor to start the program. You know, if school kids can do it, why can't we do it? So uh, it's cheap. You know, you can have, you can, from, you know, from the basics to the launch, it can cost you less than a million dollars. Again, it could less time. You know, if you're going to develop those big satellites, it can take up to years. Some people spend their entire career. You know, they spend 25 years working in the same office building those big mega satellites. Those, on the other hand, they can be, you know, thinking of the idea to when it reaches the space, it can take one year, right? And again, they're cheap. So, the, uh, like I said, let's discuss something that we call Earth observation. Earth observation, let's start by defining it first. So Earth observation is the process of taking images of planet Earth so that we can manage resources, understand uh, more on, on, that, on the next slide, all right? So why is Earth observation important? Well, if we have images from space, we can forecast weather. We can determine if there's a storm coming up or not. We can uh, allocate resources. So let's say we can uh, take images of construction. And then I can tell that this area has a lot of constructions, but then we don't have enough piping network, electrical network, to supply these areas. So images from space are really, really valuable. Right? But then when we talk about value, we can link it to you know, uh, economics or agriculture. So let's first talk about agriculture. Right? We all, you know, the people think now that because of the Russia-Ukraine issue, there is a shortage in grains. So we need to plant more wheat, we need to plant more, overall we have a, a global shortage on produce. So if we have, let's say, you know, to plant, you know, to plant, you need good soil. So I, I can, what I can do is that I can put three, four, five engineers in one car with their measuring instruments, they could go to spots, and then they would measure the soil moisture. Is the soil good for farm plantation or not? Well, how long are they going to do this? Are they going to do this for every kilometer of land? That's, uh, that's not a feasible way to do it, right? But what if we have a satellite in space? with really advanced imagery that can tell us the soil moisture, it can tell us the chemical composition of the soil. That is before farming. And then once we determine that this plot of land is good for farming, let's plant our seeds. Well, the plants have started growing. How do I make sure that my plantation is fine? Do I have any disease spreading in my plantation? Uh, do I have watering issues? Am I going to send again uh, my farmer in a pickup truck and then he would just go and then check each and every plant and leave? With the same advanced technologies, we can determine if these plants are sick, do they need more water, do they need more fertilizers, right? What about economics? You know, people from the economics or in the business industry, they all like to translate it into dollar value. Of course, satellites give us dollar value, right? Let's first define economics. Economics is the study. It's, it's the science of the producing, managing wealth. Right? So 
so how is it important in terms of economics? Well, if I have images from space, I, let's say I'm an, I'm an investor in a, in a company, right? I'm investing in a, in a supermarket. Well, that supermarket says that he has a million customers coming in every day. Am I really going to go to the register and then check? Is he giving you know, a million customers every day? No, but I can send in a satellite with a camera to take an image of the parking lot. If the parking lot is full, I can guess that's a good supermarket. That's, that's a good investment. What about power plants? If I'm going you know, to check how much energy that power plant generates, is it power plants or factories? These power plants or factories produce smoke. They produce CO2, methane, which, is, which can also be studied by satellites. We can, we can determine how much emissions such factory produce. And by the emissions, we can give a good scientific estimate on is this factory running properly? Is this power plant generating enough electricity or not? Well, we, you know, in the other world, we're always interested and eager to learn about the gas prices. Is the gas prices going to go up? Are they going to go down? Well, with satellites, we can make a scientific guess, right? If we take an image of the, uh, of the, of the petroleum storage tanks, and then one fun fact about these petroleum tanks is that they have a floating roof. So if it fills, you know, the roof goes up. If it's going down, the roof slides down. So if I have, a, if I have an image from space over these oil fields, I can tell how much the country or how much the petroleum company is producing oil. And then based on a simple calculation with volume, I can tell how many barrels per day they're producing. From this information, I can tell, you know, based on supply and demand, oil prices are going to go up or are they going to go down? Well, usually it works out for me, right? I'm not, I'm not taking this to my advantage, but when you have access to satellite images, your life is going to change, right? So enough talking about images that we can take down, looking down. What about images that we can take a look from upstairs if we flip the camera the other way? So this is one the project that uh, my colleagues and I from the University of Sharjah and the Sharjah Academy for Astronomy, Space Sciences and Technology started, which is SharjahSat-1. It is the first CubeSat project for the Emirate of Sharjah. It has two payloads. It has a dual camera system. Why? Because one is none, two is one. Two cameras is always better than one, right? And we have an improved X-ray detector, detecting X-rays from 20 to 200 keV. Not going to bore you with the science, right? But we're going there. So what's the objective? You have two objectives, of course, uh, taking images of the Emirate of Sharjah and, you know, uh, understanding X-ray emissions in outer space to understand space weather. More on that later, right? But then again, there's a hidden objective. Given that it is a university CubeSat, our main objective is to teach students. We've had an influx of students coming in from different majors, from the University of Sharjah, other universities in the UAE, and also we've had students coming in from the universities from abroad to come in and get hands-on experience in space technologies and space engineering. So the, the hidden objective is capacity building. How do we empower the youth to start working on small, cheap, rapid satellites that can be launched to space in a year, year and a half. So why is it important to study space weather, which is our primary objective? Well, like, like the weather, if you all knew that today is going to be stormy, we're going to have winds and rains, would you risk driving for an hour, hour and a half just to get to this auditorium? You would definitely have changed your plans. I know it's a, it's a fun event, it's a, it's a nice get together, but you would have changed your plans. Well, we have something in space called space weather. Well, but it does not really get windy or, or it rains in outer space. So space weather is a phenomena that is primarily affected by radiation that is coming in from the sun. It's coming in from, from black holes, but primarily from the sun. You know, the sun is very active with all of these explosions that are happening. You know, it just shoots out helium molecules and high energy particles. But then again, how does this affect us on Earth, right? Of course it affects us on Earth. Because let's say we have those satellites that we talked about previously, they send, in their, they send in their communication via radio, right? You have the emergency management systems here in the, in everywhere in the world, the police, the ambulances, they all use radio frequency, you know, they communicate with each other. So all of these high energy particles inter coming in from the sun, they can damage our satellites because they're full of electrons and then they're going to mess up your electronics. That radiation is going to interfere with radio signals. So you're going to have something that's called a radio blackout. All right? 
sorry, for some reason my slides keep changing. Like something's wrong with the pointer. All right, so you're gonna have a, a radio blackout storm, like I mentioned, you know, come, you know, the police is gonna try to use the radio, so you're gonna hear nothing but white noise. As an end user, you're gonna tune into your favorite radio channel, all you're gonna hear is you're gonna hear white noise. Why? Because the sun decided to be active on that day. So what if we can understand this, predict this? How can we protect our satellites and infrastructure from falling down because of all of this? And then again, it affects us in something that is called solar radiation storm. When the sun is really active and it's shooting all of these high energy particles, it can endanger our astronauts. If we have astronauts on board the International Space Station that are just being hit by radiation left and right, well, I'm sure that's gonna be bad for their health. So we have to put in the right shielding put them in the right capsules, and sometimes electronics can fail in space, and having your electronics fail in space is definitely not a good thing, right? We also have geomagnetic storm. As the sun blows up these high electron and high charged particles, well, guess what types of electronics that we have here on the ground that can be damaged by such systems? Power grids, right? So if we have a power grid, uh, you know, like your national electrical company, all of these electrons are gonna go somewhere. They're gonna end up in these wiring. What's gonna happen? They're gonna damage the power grid. You're gonna wake up, your phone is not charged, because I'm sure you all plug your phones to, before you sleep. Your phone is not charged, oh, all right. No power, okay, sure. Well, no signal. Why? Because cell towers use electricity. Hospitals, they all use electricity. All of this can be done. Why? Because of space weather. So it is important to understand space weather. In conclusion, I, I know I, I spoke a lot about satellite technologies, but that's not the core of today's topic, right? We're here to talk about the youth. Our space program, the Chargisat-1, has been built by university students, right? Aside from my manager right there, he's definitely not a university student, he's a university professor, 65 years and above. So, but all of us, the team of engineers, we are all below 27. We started with this project in our, in our university, but we were kind of late into the space space. You know, we have kids in high schools, in elementary schools that are starting their satellite programs. So my advice to the youth is, work on your extracurricular activity. In the, the job market is cutthroat. You know, you're, you're gonna have people competing with you left and right. You're always gonna have an advantage when you have something extra. That's why they call it extracurricular activities. Engage in extracurricular activities. Learn a thing or two about robotics, programming. Start a space program in your university. Nobody's gonna say no. Well, it's a, it's a million dollar project. Yes, but in a university funding scheme, that can be peanuts. But you are establishing the right mindset to go into the job market ready. Thank you.